Howdy. Ah, uh, heck nah. Not again. What? Holy Kunga Darrow. We have a cat tier request. I'm gonna be honest. I did not expect to get one of these so soon. What's the topic? Smile in Undertale and Deltarune? Oh boy. Before we get started, spoilers for Undertale and Deltarune. Don't hassle people for using text to speech, and be nice to your fellow theorists when you disagree in the comments. Four years now people have wondered, why is this file named Smile? Is it some hint about the true nature of Gaster? But before I can answer that, we need to talk about the motifs in Undertale and Deltarune. No, not that kind. A motif in fiction refers to any repeating image, word, sound, etc. that represents an idea or theme within that story. Often if the motif is being represented by an image or object, we call that a symbol. Okay that was a bit abstract of me so let's look at some examples. In Undertale, light blue is a symbol used to represent patience. We know this because of the blue attacks, which require us to stay still. But the game also spells this out for us in the golf minigame, which gives you different flags and messages whenever you roll the ball into this hole. For the light blue message, the ball has to be small, which will only occur if the player leaves the snowball alone for a while without touching it before scoring the goal. If you completely ignore it, it despawns. So to get this flag, the idea is that the player must wait patiently for the right moment to score the goal. It's important to note that while the colors are often symbolic in these games, their usage is not strictly enforced. For example, red is often used for danger, but it's also the color of the player's soul, and the color most associated with the first fallen human. Sometimes the game even uses it ironically, by applying it to words that obviously don't follow the rule, sort of as a joke, which may be frustrating to theorists who are used to looking for counterproofs to prove a theory but, as my English teacher used to say, English isn't about always following the rules, it's about knowing what the rules are so that when you break them, it's intentional and sending a message. For a more lore-heavy example of symbolism in Undertale and Deltarune, might I present the pie? The pie is a recurring symbol used to represent the bonds between the members of a family, particularly the dreamers. We see this when Toriel first meets Frisk and then hurries off to make them a pie because she wants them to feel at home with her in the ruins. We also see this in Deltarune when Toriel mentions how lonely the house feels without Asgore and Asriel, and how she hopes that sharing a pie with Chris will help them feel a little less lonely. Back in Undertale's new home, we can see that the trash is full of discarded recipes for butterscotch pie, representing Asgore's lost connection to his family, with the death of his children and the departure of his wife. When you see the pie as a symbol representing this motif of familial bonds, it actually makes this moment in Chapter 2 even more touching, as by offering to bake a pie with Susie, Toriel is symbolically offering to share some of the warmth and love of a family with Chris's new friend, which is something Susie seems to be lacking from her own family. But what if a motif or symbol is strictly enforced like a scientific law? Is there a word for that? Why yes you delicious little apple, when that happens we call that a signature. One example of a signature in Undertale would be Sans Magic doing karma damage. Since one of Sans motifs is that of a judge, it makes sense that one of the ways he manifests said motif is through the use of karma. No other characters as of yet do karma damage. So for now, karma is the signature magic of Sans. Signatures can also be applied to larger groups. For example, bone-shaped bullets are currently the signature of skeletons. However one type of magic being a signature does not imply that all magic scales up in the same way. For example, fire magic is a motif associated with boss monsters like Toriel and Asgore, but it's not exclusive to them because it's also used by Pyrope. That said, signatures and motifs can be used to tie characters together without actually showing them together. For example, by naming this attack, Gaster Blasters, the game is implying that this attack is, somehow, Gaster's signature magic, and that, at some point he taught it to Sans, and possibly Papyrus. By drawing connections between characters using these tools, stories can comment on the actions and relations of characters by highlighting similarities in their mentality, situation, or history, and they can subvert them entirely, and thus create a sense of contrast, or surprise. Okay, now that I've apparently taught you all fictional tropes like a discount version of the games as literature channel, let's talk about smile as a motif and potential signature of Gaster. 
A smile is actually a symbol in the real world, not as a storytelling tool, but as a method of communication in Western cultures. When we smile at each other, it's used as a common shorthand to convey happiness. So we might smile when we meet up with a friend, receive a gift, or because we're a minimum wage employee and our corporate overlords want us to convey that we're happy to interact with our customers. Undertale does have a few instances of a smile being used in this traditional way, such as the smile Noelle gave Susie when she lent Susie her pencil, the smile Chris gives after Susie tells a dark joke to cheer them up, and the smile the glad dummy gives after fusing with their body. Although that last one is maybe not quite so wholesome as the others, but I think by now, a lot of you have already realized, people don't always smile when they're happy, do they? As with the minimum wage employee, a lot of smiles we give can be forced, either because we want to convey friendliness or approval. In psychology, we call that a social smile, or in TV tropes, this would be a Stepford smile, and Undertale is absolutely full of them. For example, when we cheer naps to look on, we do so by giving them a patient smile. When Toriel tells a bad pun at the end of the true pacifist run, Papyrus gives her a pity smile. A few times, the game actually pressures the player to give a social smile, such as the mushroom in Tem Village who calls you rude for failing to smile at their dance. Or the time Alphys tells you not to worry about Asgore, and to instead, forget about it and smile. Here we start to move into the dark side of social smiling, that is, forcing a smile to hide your pain. Like when you kill Torio, or when you kill Asgore, or Papyrus, Undyne, Flowey, Metaton, Sans, heck even Asriel allegedly did this, at least according to the monsters in New Home, who claim Asriel looked at the humans killing him, smiled, and walked away. This is a disturbingly consistent pattern in these games, because while it might make sense for Torio or Asgore to try to reassure us in death, it seems a bit unusual to imagine every boss fight monster would do this, even in the most tense and trying of situations. And I dare say this might be evidence for the theory about losing hope being a potential lethal state in monsters. We don't have any direct evidence for this of course, but if true, it might explain why Asgore and Papyrus are so determined to do whatever they have to, to keep people from losing hope. And if that theory is true, then, I dare say, smiling might be a tool for helping a monster boost their determination and hold on for just a little bit longer. I know that's a stretch, but it would line up with our local smiley trash bags need to maintain a smile and crack jokes as a way of holding on to that last HP. And even if it's not literally true, smiling to boost morale does seem to be one of the game's motifs, which is particularly well illustrated right here. In Snowden, there is an orange demon monster, who says that although we all know the underground has problems, we smile anyway. He seems to be in tune with the vibes of the monsters in the area, because if you kill Papyrus he'll say that. Just now, I felt my smile falter, for a moment. Kind of like he felt a disturbance without really knowing why. And after you destroy the barrier, the monsters there no longer have to fight against the oppressive weight of spending their whole lives trapped underground. And so, the orange demon now says, Finally, I'll be able to stop smiling. Reinforcing this idea that he felt obligated to force a smile to keep his spirits from faltering. So there we have it, those are the three types of smiles in Undertale, and there's absolutely nothing else even worth mentioning. Oh. <laughs> Alright, we've talked about all the smiles as expressions of joy. Now, let's talk about smiles as an expression of malice, such as Undyne flashing us a menacing smile, Lancer's dad giving us a berserk smile, and whatever the hell this is. Because while some smiles can be used to reassure or bolster the spirits, some kind of do the opposite. These are your slasher smiles that inspire fear and show the player that the character they were dealing with is mischievous or even sadistic. Arguably the best example we have for this one, is none other than our best friend himself, Flowey the Flower. Flowey can be good at faking a nice smile, but mainly he's just full of malicious smiles. From friendliness pellets, to Omega Flowey, the moment you see that grin break out you just know you're about to have a bad time. But one of the things that's very interesting about a malicious smile is, I can't really come up with an objective list of guidelines for spotting one. It seems to be a social phenomenon that, while objectively unmeasurable, has an obvious and immediate resonance with the players who see it. It's pretty common for smiles like this to trip the uncanny valley by being either crooked, sharp, realistic, or way, way too wide. But that doesn't seem to be the only requirement, so we kind of have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. 
but for the true classic creepy smiles we've come to expect, copyright 2000X, we've obviously gotta go to our number one rated salesman. Kara. What? Who else would I mean? Kara's creepy face is mentioned multiple times, starting with the VHS tapes in the pacifist run, and then many, many times throughout the genocide run. Most of the time, the characters refer to it as Kara's creepy face, but a few interactions, such as this one with Flowey, seem to specify that it looks, um, sadistically happy shall we say? We don't have to rely on speculation here either, because we actually see Kara's smiling face, starting in Waterfall whenever we find a new monster to kill. We also see it at the end of a soulless pacifist run, and it's mentioned by name as a creepy smile in this unused room in Waterfall. Although that one's arguably not canon, since I'm not sure Toby ever intended to let us see this one. Although, he does seem to intend for us to be able to reach Entry 17 in the exact same way, and both this room and Entry 17 are excluded from the dog check blockade, so, maybe this is canon? It's hard to say. Wait. Tried to catch a bug but just got a cold. Gosh darn it. Snowgrave's gonna make everything creepy retroactively, isn't it? Either way, the phrase, creepy smile, certainly seems to imply that this is referring to Kara and not Gaster. But you know what does link Gaster to the creepy smiles? Entry 17. I mean, the song that plays here, not the entry itself. Although, the Wingdings could have a smiley face if Gaster ever used the letter J in any of these messages, since Gaster uses all caps. I can't tell if this is intentional or not. Wait. Is that why the secret bosses use all caps for almost everything they say? Now that I think about it, the secret bosses both have items that have the ability to smile at the party too. As Spampton's loaded disc is described as a strange disc, you can feel it smiling in your hand. And, should we give Noelle the devil's knife, she'll tell us that it smiled at her. Anyway, if we look at the sound file of entry 17, we can see that the background music, for lack of a better word, is named smile.ogg. This could be a machine or something, of course, but given that it's literally a slowed, distorted version of the Herd Girl sound, which is used for Muffet's laugh, it's hard to say for sure what precisely this sound could be. Wait a second. Breaking news. According to her correspondence down on ground level, Sergio and Salty Seabread, it would seem this sound file is from the SGM collection of sound fonts, which is distorted and stretched. Wait, so you could say to make this sound, we stretch, Smile. How does Toby keep doing this? I can't even. Right. So smile.ogg. At the moment, this sound is the thing most directly connecting Gaster to the Dark World, the bunker, and spammed in himself. So at this point it's become something of his calling card. If we take into account his choice of English font, Japanese font, the secret bosses, and all of these spooky smiling sprites and their various connections to either Spamton, Jebel, or Gaster himself, then I think it's fairly reasonable to say we can place Gaster next to Sans, Kara, and Flowey, in terms of who uses smiling as a big part of their motif. But is his a Cheshire Cat smile like Spamton's and Jevil's? Or a forced smile like Sans and this orange demon? Poor Kano Lostos, why not both? Undertale and Deltarune both have a storied history of a challenging boss flashing a menacing smile even when they were depressed, soulless, or otherwise living in torment, and it seems to me that Gaster will likely be no exception. His stats are absurdly high, and he has countless references to demons and the devil, so it does seem likely that he will be thrashing our asses at some point. But he also built the core, which has been a huge boon to all of Monster Kind. If we choose to read into the sound test room, one of the songs here is named Happy Town, which certainly seems to imply an intention to spread joy, and if we consider the impact he had on the king and queen, it seems like they are trying to spread joy as well. The queen even saying, I just want to make everyone smile, and if I become an evil villain to accomplish that, is that bad? Which, smells like foreshadowing if you ask me. I think the main questions remaining are, does this use of the smile motif create yet another link between Kara and Gaster? They do both exist in a nebulous sort of space, and do seem to have cornered the market on demons and devils as a motif. Although I'm not sure how this will end up applying to Deltarune with Kara's status and the ambiguous state it's in. Is this giant Cheshire cat grin yet another link between Gaster and IC? I dunno, I really hope not. But to me the much more interesting question is, 
Is this another link between Gaster and Ralse? Let's put aside the fact that Ralse is the Dark Prince, and all the symbolic imagery tying Gaster, Jebel, and Chris to the Devil, and Spampton, and Ralse to prophets and priests. Because honestly, these games are so full of allusions to Lucifer, it deserves its own video. Instead, let's focus purely on the symbolism and motifs within the game itself, and ask ourselves, is Ralse sus because he has personally spoken with W.D. Gaster? Well, let's see. When we first meet him he uses the same ware pronoun that Gaster does in Japanese, but that could just be a coincidence. He also knows Chris and Susie's name somehow, despite never having met them, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt here and assume he was just spying on us, and overheard it somehow. Even then, Ralse is still a very unusual character because, much like Jebel, he seems to know more about the Dark Worlds than anyone else. You might argue he knows this because he's the Dark Prince, but Queen doesn't know about the Roaring, so clearly being the ruler of your Dark World doesn't automatically grant you that knowledge. How did he learn about the Roaring? How does he know so much about the Dark Fountains? His entire town is completely empty, leaving him all alone in the dark like the gunner vessel, or whatever it is we hear screaming for help in the unused code. But that might not mean he's connected to Gaster. What if he just heard about this stuff from the night? Or, what if he was just born with this knowledge, the same way it seems like the computer lab just magically spawned with this intricate storied history that stretches back for years, despite being created literally a few hours ago. And that's possible. But even if that's true, that still suggests either Ralsei's item, or the closet, was in some way connected to Gaster. Because the knowledge Ralsei starts with, the legend of the Delta Rune, is the exact same message we see Gaster reciting in the Delta Rune homepage in July of 2017. In addition, while Susie gets a devil's knife for beating Jevil, as a sort of nod to her daredevil slash troublemaker attitude, Ralsei gets a puppet scarf for defeating Spamton. Who is Ralse a puppet to, if not Gaster, and or, the knight? He also names Castle Town after the name the player gave Gaster during the character creator segment. How could Ralse know about that name, if not from Gaster himself, or from Chris, who doesn't seem super talkative, but they did have that moment together in the cell, so who knows? Either way, this would explain Ralse's religious motifs of praying and worshipping, as well as acting as sort of a missionary to Lancer and his father. It explains how Ralse seems to know so much about the light world. Even if we assume his glasses are shadow crystals, he had to have gotten them from somewhere. And it explains his constant upbeat attitude, even when he's being hurt, or insulted, or ignored. In fact, if we want to dig really deep, there's actually an item in the game files called the Cheer Scarf, which, as you might expect, can only be equipped by Ralse, and gives him the effect, Smiley. It even has a little wingding for an icon, and you can call that a coincidence if you like, but there are plenty of items that give effects and don't have their own special icon. You know most special weapons just use a little up or down arrow, and even if he had to put a smiley here, there are a lot of icons he could have used aside from the wingding. Wait. Hold up. Ralse uses this icon in Chapter 1 too, for kindness? What? Okay look, I know it sounds like I'm jumping at shadows, but none of the other icons are like this. Root isn't, like, a frowny face for example, and a smiley face J wingding is a really odd way to symbolize kindness, like, if the cheer scarf came first and then the icon was reused for kindness, I could understand. But cheer scarf wasn't added until chapter 2, so we just have this inexplicable wingding here, in a sea of non-wingding icons, at least until chapter 2 brings us coldness, which, um? Wait. I could maybe excuse the smiley face, but there are a lot of ways to draw a snowflake, like famously so. Why is Toby so partial to using snowflakes that resemble this wingding? Is, is this just my life now? Is every new chapter of Deltarune gonna give us one new wingding in the stats menu and one new unused entry? Doing a snow grave route does give us this chapter's darker yet darker callback too. Huh. That's either a weird coincidence, or Toby is playing the craziest game of 4D storytelling chess I've ever seen. Actually now that I think about it, that means Chris's pencil corresponds with the exclamation point. The deal maker, which increases your money dropped, corresponds with the dollar sign. The two phones are parentheses. Huh. I should probably get out of here before I lose what's left of my sanity. What do you guys think? Is Smile a calling card for Gaster? 
or is it like Carrie's connection to the color red, and we need to take each example on a case-by-case -case basis? Is Ralph say secretly Gaster's puppet? Or, is there something else going on here? Let me know down in the comments, and thank you again to Monster Box for being one of our first cat tiers. I. What? 30. 30,000 subs. I. I haven't even been doing this for a year. What? Where are you all coming from? Apparently there are people discussing my videos in other languages now? What is this I don't even? I guess it's time to launch the Spanish sister channel so I can make my videos more accessible? I can't believe people are liking my stuff so much that I'd need to consider that, though. To that end, please welcome aboard Sergio, our Spanish translator, and Freds from the Freds Dimension, a fellow YouTuber himself, who will be resyncing the Spanish versions. You should totally check out his channel, he does a ton of stuff including role-playing, card games, gaming, LARP, and nerdy shenanigans I've never even heard of. Also please welcome Molly Stars, our newest editor who somehow survived the horrible burning trial by fire that was the application process. And until next time. Wait. What? Um? Fa- Fan art? Oh. My god. Salty Sea Bread made me a custom sprite. I mean, it's not technically my first, Cell made me several cool custom roller coaster sprites, but... I... Wait, there's more. Holy Kungadero someone made a reddit of my channel, and people are drawing actual hand sketched pictures of my weird bread based avatar. I... I don't know what to say. I've never had people making fan art of me or my work before. Thank you all so much for all the love and support. Being on YouTube can come with a lot of unexpected stress and fear, but you all give so much to me, I cannot thank you enough. Whether you're one of those hardcore fans waiting to comment the second a video drops, one of my extremely generous patrons supporting me directly, or just a casual viewer discussing my weird little videos with other people, it means the world to me. Truly, mwah, words fail me but, thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more hyperlink blocked.